Well, let us pray. Lord, we thank you so very much for your word, and we do thank you that it was on the last and the greatest day of the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles that you, Jesus, stood up and you said with a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, that whoever believes in you, as the scripture says, that streams of living water will flow from within us. We thank you that we live in the age of the Spirit, just as you said that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men to yourself, and we are most thankful that we are able to come to your house. Uh, we marvel that we not only come to your house, but we are also your temples, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us as individuals, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us corporately as we worship in spirit and truth. And we ask that you would bless us uh, this evening as we continue to look at Peter. Uh, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity as Peter was the one that you, Jesus, chose to be your apostle, the one whom you chose to uh, proclaim the good news of the accomplishment of salvation on the day of Pentecost. And we ask now that the Spirit would open our eyes, that we might continue to behold wonderful things from your word, and that we would draw closer to you in our, our knowledge of you, and that we would be growing in our hope, in the hope of glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> this uh, last Lord's Day, as we are, are just beginning Second Peter, I think this is our first Bible study in um, Second Peter. Um, but in the sermon, we looked at Second Peter chapter one and the opening verses, and how Peter talks about how we are partakers of the divine nature. And uh, we looked at what partakers of the divine nature is and is not, um, but how we really need to own this biblical language. This is one of the great and glorious truths of the gospel. Uh, it's something that we can spend the rest of our lives thinking about and also enjoying. So, uh, for example, if a, a Buddhist were co come up to you and say, you know, I am, uh, uh, I am one with nature or something like that, say, oh, that's interesting. I'm also a partaker of the divine nature. What do you mean by that? And just because they mean something very differently, pantheistically, idolatrously different, uh, we can't let them own that. We have to say, no, this is what it means to be a partake of the, the divine nature, that the divine eternal son of God uh, took upon himself flesh and blood so that we might partake and so that we might become like the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this is the, the purpose for which we are made in Genesis 1 in the image of God. And part of that partaking of the divine nature is that through the work of the spirit, we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. So... Uh, the divine dwells within us, and we are united to Christ, and we are united to be fruitful in the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, we also noted some idolatrous ways in which partakers of the divine nature uh, is found. We looked at our nat uh, nation in particular, and the uh, apotheosis <laughs> uh, of George Washington. And uh, there's our United States Capitol building, which I uh, mentioned. Uh, this is a, an idolatrous way of looking at a partaking of the divine nature in that uh, George Washington, and um, uh, this is a kind of uh, deification, um, and uh, it's a representation of our founding father uh, being deified, and that's in our Capitol uh, building where the laws of our, our nation are made. There's no reference, of course, to Jesus Christ, who is the eternal Son of God, who is the great lawgiver, and uh, the one to whom the nations must bow as they think about uh, the laws of each and every nation. Uh, so this idea of deification or partaking of the divine nature, this is one idolatrous uh, way of, of looking at it, and uh, there's no shortage of these kinds of ideas. But again, we don't want to hand over this language to counterfeits. Uh, we want to take back the truth and reveal the counterfeits um, that's rooted in history, so it's rooted in the death, uh, the incarnation and the, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Are there any questions about partakers of the divine nature? All right, if there are not any questions, I'd like to uh, look at Second Peter. We'll be reading uh, the first chapter again, and what I want to focus on are a couple introductory um, issues with uh, Second Peter, looking again at who Second Peter is, why he is writing, 
Um, and I'd also like to look at some of the divine names and titles that we find in verses 1 and 2, and how this is part of the way in which we know God. So I'd like to read from 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, and uh, let's, how about we read through uh, verses 1 through 21. Uh, does anyone want to come to the mic and do that? I'm happy to read it myself, but. No takers? All right. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice those names and titles there. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established and the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but man moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All right, are there any uh, opening questions about Second uh, Peter and your thinking about this letter? All right, so a couple of introductory um, issues about Second Peter it is uh, known as one of the general epistles. It's a general, it's general in it because it's not written to a particular, uh, it's not mentioned as being written to a particular church, like uh, the book of Corinthians is written to a church, or Paul's other letters like uh, Romans or Galatians or Ephesians. Um, so the, the, the actual recipients of this letter uh, are not named, so hence the general epistle. Another general epistle would be James um, as well. Um, the author of Second Peter, uh, we understand to be Peter because of verse 1 of our text, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now the, it's interesting because the actual authorship of this letter is perhaps the most disputed of all of the New Testament books. Uh, you would think, well, why would you dispute it? Because it says Simon Peter here. Um, uh, but part of the reason is uh, some people believe that perhaps somebody else was writing under the name of Peter, uh, a pseudo uh, pigraphal uh, work, so a pseudonym, someone writing under the name of Simon Peter to give it more uh, authority. Um, but Simon Peter here does make autobiographical references. Um, so he is claiming to be 
an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also an apostle in verse 1. So an apostle, is, uh, Peter is using it, um, would be one who is chosen by Jesus uh, in the Gospels. And uh, you remember in passages like Matthew chapter 10, Jesus took, and after praying, took, and uh, he chose uh, the 12. And Peter was one of those 12, and they were known as um, apostles. So he refers to himself in verse 1 as an apostle. He refers to himself in verse 15 as an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus. He says in verse um, 18, we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's a reference to the transfiguration. Um, another reason for thinking that, and, and again, this is what we, we understand, that Peter is the one who saw this. Is, um, really, of, of all of the events he witnessed, um, he certainly witnessed the ascension of Jesus. Uh, he witnessed the resurrected Jesus. Uh, but of other things that he saw uh, throughout the three or so years of Jesus' earthly ministry, it's interesting that he does zero in on uh, the transfiguration. Um, Mark's gospel, you may remember, um, when Mark mentions uh, the transfiguration, it's almost in the exact center of uh, Mark's gospel. And Mark's gospel is also known as Peter's gospel. It's, it's believed that Peter um, is uh, the one from whom Mark got his material. Um, <clears throat> some of the circumstances for um, this uh, is that Peter is coming to the end of his life, as we've seen in the preaching in verses 14 and 15. And um, his, his death, he doesn't actually use the word death, but he uses the word in verse 15, um, his departure. So in verse 14, the laying aside of my earthly dwelling. Uh, Christians in the first century in the scriptures tended not to use the word death. They would use other words like Peter does or sleep. Um, the finality of death is not such for the Christian because death has been defeated. So it was very common in the early church to, and you see this throughout the New Testament, uh, to refer to um, death in, in other ways. So it's the laying aside of his um, earthly dwelling, uh, and it is his departure in verse 15, um, the Greek word being uh, the word his exodus. So he is on his way to uh, the promised land. Um, <clears throat> according, And I've mentioned this a couple of times, and I was kind of curious, where do we get this from? Um, that the, the tradition of for Peter's laying aside his earthly dwelling is that he... Uh, in his exodus to be with the Lord uh, in his soul, awaiting the bodily resurrection. Um, and the, the tradition is that he was crucified um, head down. And that tradition is first found probably in the second half of the second century. So 150 AD to 200 AD. Uh, there was a book called The Acts of Peter, uh, which is an apocryphal book. So again, this was written after Peter. But remembering the Acts of Peter, that is the first recorded witness. John 21 would be a witness too, but um, Jesus doesn't give the specifics about uh, Peter's death. Um, but uh, you'll find uh, the specific reference to Peter uh, being crucified uh, upside down or, or head down um, as well. And so that, that's where that comes from. And then you have later historians like Eusebius will also I'll mention Peter's death, but Eusebius was probably drawing on other sources like that. Uh, so this is why we, we um, often say, that, but we also, I always emphasize this is a tradition, so we don't know this for certain. But one of the things is we think about Peter and, and his authorship and this last letter that he is writing because he, that Jesus has made clear to him that his death is imminent. Peter, of course, is very important in the subsequent history of the church in to this day. Um, in fact, if you go to Rome, Italy, into St. Peter's uh, Cathedral, the, the seat of uh, the alleged descendant of uh, Peter, uh, you have the papal altar, and, and that's what you're looking at here. Um, and the, the papal altar, you can't see it in this particular photo, but above it is a, a, an amazingly beautiful gold dome. I think there are gold letters that are like 12 feet um, high. And uh, in Latin, is the uh, saying in Matthew 16, uh, when Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, one of Jesus' titles, which we'll be looking at, uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So above the papal altar, in gold letters, it says, beautiful, um, you are Peter, 
Uh, right below Peter then is the, or uh, the, the uh, lettering is the papal altar um, where the, the, the mass is said by the Pope. And underneath the papal altar, uh, I don't have a picture of that, is the alleged place where Peter is buried. And uh, when, when you go to Rome, uh, it's, it's very iffy. They're not really confident that these are Peter's bones, but that, that is the imagery, that Peter is buried under the one, uh, the Pope, who is uh, celebrating um, the Mass. Now, the reason I, I bring this up is because these are traditions. So there, there is a tradition about uh, Peter's death, and there are many traditions about Peter's uh, apostolic succession, traditions about what happened to his bones. And the reason this is important for anyone who is a Christian to consider, um, it doesn't matter if you're a Protestant or not, you really should be thinking about what's going on here, that these kinds of traditions, in particular the tradition about the papal altar, the bones of Peter being um, underneath that papal altar, um, is that the, these kinds of traditions um, can be stumbling blocks to non-Christians. Um, because if we as Christians believe things that are iffy about Peter's bones, and it is really iffy, but there is a picture of uh, Pope Francis um, holding the relics of St. Peter. I, I think uh, that St. Peter has actually a, a day, it's like June 26th or something, it's when Peter is remembered, and you know, the Pope allegedly, I guess he, he venerates the bones of, of, Je of uh, Peter, um, but if, if you're doing these things that are iffy, which is, th this is very iffy, um, this is not what Peter's writing about. Peter's writing about what is certain, right? So in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is not giving us iffy traditions. Um, he is saying, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. So we're not following speculations. This, so Peter's on his way to die. So yes, he, he really did die. His bones are, are somewhere. We, don't, we really don't know where that that's not what he's emphasizing. That's not what he wants us to venerate. He, he doesn't want us to bow down before his bones. He wants us to, to venerate, not, not adore, worship, uh, only God is to be adored, um, but it's, we didn't follow clever, cleverly devised tales. And we have the prophetic word. There's what Peter is handing off to us. The word of God made more sure, which you would do well to pay attention to. That's what we are to be paying attention to, uh, whether Protestant or Catholic. Um, it, it's to the Word of God. That's why we have Bible study. That's where we keep going back to the Word, back to the Word. Um, now, so as, as Christians, and I, I think sometimes Christians in, in the church, we have a reputation for being gullible. Um, and I think sometimes the word, you know, the faithful, uh, means that those who are willing to embrace iffy things like this. Um, but, but Peter was not the faithful because he believed in iffy things, because he believed in man-made speculations and traditions. This is not what Peter the Apostle is handing off to the church. He is not handing off what is speculative. He is handing off what is certain, what he saw with his own eyes, heard with his own ears, touched with his own hands, and he is saying, this is what I want you to be focusing on. Not my bones, um, and, and not these other things that go along with it. Um, so as, as Christians, we should look at these. And there are a lot of other traditions and you know, things like the Shroud of Turin. And I, I was kind of into that when I was a boy. So I, I kind of know what that's all about. And uh, my parents took me to, I think it was a church in Montreal. And uh, I, as you go up the steps there, there was huge steps. There were the faithful kneeling and praying on every single step. So they didn't just walk up the steps like I did as a kid. They knelt, I don't know how many dozens of stairs there were. And then on the inside, there were, you know, these saints and bones of saints, the heart of a saint that hadn't decomposed. And, um, and, and the faithful were going there to venerate. You can go to a lot of major cities in the world. You can go to the Vatican and, and see these things as well. And, I think as Christians, we should be just have a healthy skepticism of these kinds of things. When Peter says that he was an eyewitness uh, to the transfiguration of Jesus, he's an eyewitness because um, he believes in the law of God and that on the, the, the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Uh, it, you need evidence. The Christian faith is evidence-based. That's what he's handing up. The, the things like the bones of Jesus, the Shadr Torin, and a, a host of other things are very iffy. 
Think of all of the relics you know, that Martin Luther talks about in Wittenberg at the Reformation and the veneration and, and the time off the purgatory that people would get by uh, going to Wittenberg and other uh, places um, like that. that. That is not what the Christian faith is, is about. That we did not follow cleverly devised tales, the apostle tells us. We were eyewitnesses. So the church is a witness to what Peter wit uh, was an eyewitness to. So you and I are not eyewitnesses to the miracles that Jesus did. Um, you and I did not taste the wedding wine at Cana of Galilee. Uh, we uh, did not see Jesus put mud on uh, a, blind, a man born blind and, and hear him say, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Peter did. He was an eyewitness to these things. And, and our witness as a church is to, to testify in the witness what the word of God says. So the eyewitness, the apostolic church is saying, here is what we saw, like the transfiguration. And now, in, now we're not testifying. Peter didn't say, testify to my bones, venerate my bones and other things. He said, testify to what I saw. Testify to that which was established. Testify to the fact that I saw, Peter says, Elijah and Moses. I saw the whole summary of the Old Testament centering on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we are testifying to as, as the church of God. And so sometimes churches can get sidetracked and Christians can get sidetracked on things other than the word of God, but this is what Peter is handing off to us. Um, it is, it is the, the, the scriptures. So any comments or questions as we think about who Peter is? Um, not uh, bones, traditions, eyewitness, uh, testimony authorship. Heidi? Um, what year would you say it started? That the veneration of bones? bones? The Pope said to Peter and we're next in line. Um, well, there's probably a long tradition behind that, but I think officially uh, it was about 1967. Uh, I think it was 1967. It wasn't, uh, it's not um, I think somebody where they said the Pope was buried. Or the Peter, you mean? The Peter was after the every Pope came after Peter. Oh, that um, they would claim that goes back to the first century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So who was his first successor? <laughs> well, that's that, that's the point that I'm trying to make is that Peter isn't the successor that he leaves here in the text is the Word of God. That so um, like in Second Peter three and verses one and two. The, the, what Peter is saying, he's not saying, here is my successor. I forget the, the name of the first one, but you know, uh, it, it's not Clement, but let's say it's Clement. You know, here's my successor, Clement of Rome. Um, he's not saying that. He's not saying, follow what Clement says. He's, after I, I uh, go to be with the Lord, um, he says in verses one and two of chapter three, now this is now beloved, uh, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. That, that's the successor to Peter. It's the word of God. Um, and, and that's what we need to keep going to. So I'm not downplaying the importance of early church leaders. Um, that, of course, that's, that's part of our tradition. I'm not downplaying the importance of church councils, the ecumenical especially the first seven ecumenical councils. I don't, uh, I love those. I, I love the Synod of Jerusalem and Acts 15 and, and subsequent church history. Um, but but uh, unfortunately, people tend to get sidetracked by other um, things that the apostles did not hand off to us. Mm -hmm. So we need to, I think, be very skeptical of all of these other traditions and keep going back to what Peter says. This is what I want you to hold on to. Yeah. So that, I, that's my understanding. A successor of Peter is the one who's remind, remembering those things that he said, I want you to remember this. Mm -hmm. We should be much more excited about the transfiguration of Jesus than even if we did have the actual bones of Peter. You know, we, I, I was showing the kids in the class this week the ossuary of James. You know, I mean, we may have the, the burial box where James's bones were put. Um, James... Uh, uh, the half brother of Jesus, but but that's not what we are are, are about. Uh, the, the early church is about the Word of God. That that's what they're handing off to us. 
but we just want to be careful not to get sidetracked um, on other things. And I, I, I personally know, just you know, growing up, how, how easy that is to become sidetracked on things like that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? All right, so as we think about um, faith, and of course, we, in our text uh, this evening, uh, verse one, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. All right, so our faith isn't in traditions and speculations and other things like that. We have received a faith, uh, a faith the same as the kind of faith that Peter received. Um, so as we think about faith, um, do you agree or disagree with this picture? This is a common representation of, of faith, um, but do, do you, I'm going to say you should actually disagree with this picture, um, but can you tell me what's wrong with this idea of faith? So we're talking about the Christian faith. We're talking about the scriptures, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and what's wrong with um, this? And is this the faith that we have received? Any, any thoughts? Because I'm going back to this idea of testimony, eyewitnesses, two or three witnesses. So I'm, I'm taking us back to a courtroom, all right? That, that's how the, we should understand the scriptures. The um, uh, term eyewitnesses is uh, a courtroom term. Um, that, so he's testifying uh, to these things. Uh, so what are we to think about this? Okay. So what's wrong with, wh where, where should we put faith then if it's not on the scale with proof? Where would you put proof here? Because we do believe in evidence, proof. I mean, this is, this is an eyewitness. That, that's why it's so important. We, we have the, the eyewitness testimony here, and of course in the Gospels. Peter's handing this off. Don't forget my witness. Don't forget that what I've testified to that's been established in a court of law by God himself because Jesus rose again from the dead. So you could put it on the proof? Put that, put faith on top of proof? Uh, 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 proof? I think you're getting there. This is where I would put it. <clears throat> I would put the fa biblical faith as the judge's gavel. A decision is made. Biblical, the Christian faith is not represented by placing faith on a scale. Get faith off of the, of the scale altogether. It's actually more, it's more accurate to say the Christian faith is represented by a gavel because biblical faith is a belief. It's the verdict or the finding based on the evidence. So you weigh evidence on scales and then you give a, a verdict. A verdict is a belief. It is a finding. And so the Christian belief or the faith is that the gavel of the evidence um, this is what the eyewitness has said. So that, that's actually, I think, a better way of, of looking at the, the biblical um, faith. Um, so uh, an unhealthy skepticism would be a judge that ignores evidence or refuses to give a, a, a verdict. So this is just part of our, our witness to other people. So other, the world will tend to look at this um, you know, proof and, and faith on a, a kind of some kind of balance. And they'll say to you, right, I wish I had your faith because I really need more faith because the evidence isn't there. No, no. Uh, the, the gavel, that's, it's the belief. That's what the Christian faith is about. And so a judge uh, that ignores evidence or refuses to give a verdict um, th this is a terrible situation to be in. So I, I was looking it up on uh, Google uh, and of course, I'm not a, a law, um, I'm not a lawyer, so. Uh, but in the United States, I read that in the annals of lengthy jury deliberations, perhaps the longest ever was the famous Long Beach, California case in 1992, which took 11 years getting to trial, six months of testimony, and four and a half months of jury deliberations. In the UK, there was an article, we spent almost two years sitting on a jury. How would you like to do jury duty for two years? 
how would you like to do it for four months? And, and as Christians, what we're, what we're saying is, here is the biblical evidence. Don't put Jesus off. In one way, you're the one on trial. You're, I'm the sinner. I need something done with my conscience and my sin. And the good news of the gospel is the verdict has already been given. Through faith in Jesus, the Savior, we have forgiveness of sins. And so a lot of people who are not Christians or agnostics, they're not... It's like they're, they're doing jury deliberations or they're not even looking or bothering. And you need to look at the evidence because you're a sinner, you're going to die. So don't keep putting it off and sitting in your little jury deliberation room or just ignoring it. It would be like a judge just saying, you know what, I'm not going to bother looking at anything anymore. Um, you're going to die and, and you're a sinner. So instead of that scale where you're putting, oh, I wish I had your faith, as if faith is some kind of you know, muscle that we have that we exercise, uh, no, it, the, the evidence is there. The eyewitness testimony is there. Uh, you need to be putting your faith and your trust in, in Jesus. The, uh, the witness, the eyewitness testimony is reliable. Um, it is true, and it is trustworthy. Peter wants us to remember these things. He doesn't want you to be remembering, oh, those, those is his bones. Let's show the world his bones. Okay, yes, Peter is a historical person, so bones are important, but that's not the Christian faith. That's not why we believe in Jesus, because we have his bones. Um, in fact, I think you're giving the wrong message if you're focusing on the bones. Um, yeah, we all have bones, and we're all going to die. We're all going to decompose. Um, but the, there's another story to those bones, and the, what Peter was excited about was that, yes, those bones will be raised. They haven't been yet, um, but that he is on his way to, to glory, and he can, we know that with certainty because he saw the transfigured Jesus and the glorified Jesus. So it's, it's of the utmost important that we understand the kind of faith that we have received so that we can talk to others about faith and that we not have wrong ideas about what the Christian faith is not. And unfortunately, um, I think we often get that confused. Um, any other comments or questions as we think about who is Peter, uh, the importance of not being gullible, eyewitness testimony, um, and the, the Christian faith? All right, um, so as we think about Peter's final emphasis on the Word of God, uh, what I wanted to, to spend the rest of the evening looking at are uh, knowing God through his names and titles. So it's the, the knowledge of God. No, knowledge is mentioned multiple times uh, throughout Second Peter, for example, in verse 3, um, seeing that his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and excellence. Um, so one of the ways in which we can know God, uh, of course, is by studying his, his word. Uh, you really can't know God by, by Peter's bones, all right? So you're, that, that's not what Peter is interested. So uh, we can know God, though, through God's word and through Peter's letter. So this is what Peter is handing off to us. And we can know God through the study of the scriptures. We can know God by following Jesus and obeying him. Uh, and, and one of the ways we can study the scriptures to know God is by studying the names of God and the titles of Jesus. And it, it's, it took me a while just to find them all in verses 1 uh, and 2. But it, it's quite remarkable how many names and titles um, that you find uh, just in verses 1 and uh, 2. Um, so Jesus, that's a name. You can learn so much about who Jesus is just by studying his name, uh, as we'll see. Um, Christ, that's not a name, that's a title. And there's so much we can learn about Christ. Uh, we can, and uh, Peter also with that title. Uh, but there, then again, is the name God. I, I sometimes wrestle, is that a name or a title? Um, so I put both. Savior, that's a title. Jesus, name, Christ, title. Uh, God, title name, Jesus, and of course, um, Lord. Now, how do we know from Scripture that the names and the titles of God are important? So let's back up and say, why, why do we know that these are important in the first place? And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, um, I, I've noticed in my study of Scriptures, I can read First Peter, or Second Peter, the first chapter, multiple times, and not really even pay attention to the names of God. And it's like, whoa, hold on a second. There's so much here. 
um, to, to each and every one of these. So how do we know from Scripture, not just because they're, uh, yes, certainly because they're in verses 1 and 2, but how do we know why they are so important? Yeah, the book of Exodus and the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, when God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Um, and that was, that's God's memorial name for all generations. So he's the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he didn't reveal his name in that way um, to them, but uh, to Moses and to the generation subsequent as I am, as, as Yahweh. Good. So that's one of the ways we know the importance of God's name. And uh, so also his titles. Any other ways? Miracles surrounding names. Oh, okay, yes. You know, mm -hmm. you think when Joseph had a vision, that there was this, well, and even with John. Yep. Right, right. And I thought it, then yeah. Jesus, mm -hmm. the same thing. Mary did not pick his name. Yes. That, that's right. So you're getting ahead of me to one of the names of Jesus. But um, yes, that was a name that was uh, set apart for him um, by God and the angel. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular of the third commandment. If you want to know the importance of names, look to the law of God. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And commenting on that, uh, the Shorter Catechism asks in question 54, what is required in the third commandment? The third commandment requires the holy and reverent use of the God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, word, and works. Um, so it's uh, the importance of names and titles for God is found in the, the third commandment also. Uh, and certainly in the places you mentioned and, and many other places in the scriptures. Now, I, I started um, a list for names and titles for Jesus, um, and uh, there are a couple here in verses 1 and 2, um, but uh, can you think of any other names and titles uh, besides verses 1 and 2 for um, Jesus that we find? Um, well, I didn't really even do the Old Testament. I just focused on New Testament, but yeah, there, you, you, Old Testament too. But can you think of some of the names and titles, John? Emmanuel. Yeah, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, I was talking with uh, somebody uh, today, and that's the one she brought up is Emmanuel, um, God with us. Yeah, so you can learn who is Emmanuel, who is Jesus. So I mean, he's, he's God with us, which is an amazing thing to study when you look at God with us throughout the scriptures, uh, that Jesus is Emmanuel. Good. Any other names or titles for Jesus? John? Wonderful Counselor. Yeah, if you go back to Isaiah, again, in Isaiah 9, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yeah, that was another one I talked about in, uh, this afternoon. Any other names and titles? Cornerstone. Yeah, the Cornerstone. Uh, yeah, the Cornerstone. That's one of Peter's, uh, also in First Peter, too, uh, but also going back to Psalm 118. Good. Any other names, titles? We could probably be here all night um, just brainstorming. John? Back to Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. Oh, yeah, that's a wonderful one. Uh, and just to trace that genealogy and that seed. Um, mm, yeah, it's very rich. Couple, some others, just very you know, briefly. Um, uh, like I said, we could spend... Um, I mean, the next year, just looking at some of these, but the Son of Man, that was one of the, the t um, titles Jesus used for himself. Uh, very seldom, maybe four times other people will call Jesus Son of Man. Um, Stephen did right before he was martyred. Um, but Jesus uses it over 70 times for himself, so the Son of Man. Think of the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God, he's called the Son of Man. Master, um, Emmanuel, uh, Son of Man, um, Messiah, Almighty, Alpha, and Omega. And of course, he is called by his name um, about 625 times um, in the New Testament, where we have reference to Jesus. And uh, 
as Heidi pointed out, that was the name given to him in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, uh, where uh, the angel said that uh, she will bear a son. And that goes back, like John said, to Genesis 3.15, that idea of childbirth and uh, the bearing of a seed. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And you remember, um, that was the great question and the riddle of Proverbs chapter 30. You know, I, in the book of Proverbs and Wisdom, you have this guy named Agur who says, I'm the stupidest of men. Yeah, so who's the stupidest man in the Bible? Well, Agur says he was in Proverbs 30 because he didn't know the name of God's son. And so when that was revealed, that's a big deal because that name is uh, being looked for ever since God promised of the gospel in Genesis 3. And the angel says then, and goes on, that you will call his name Jesus, and then the meaning is given. So the angel actually gives the, the meaning, um, which goes back to the Hebrew, he will save his people from their sins. And uh, that's the, so Jesus is the, the Greek um, form of uh, Yeshua, uh, Joshua, uh, in the, the Old Testament. So he will save his people from their sins. And so as you meditate on this name, Jesus, and Peter also refers to Jesus as Savior in um, verse 1 of our text. So that's one of the titles uh, that he uses. Um, what do we learn then from this idea that Jesus is um, a Savior from sin? Uh, what, or, or also a Savior, but uh, what else can we learn um, from this idea that Jesus uh, saves us from sin? John? Um, yes, that would be uh, one of the things, that he is God. God is the one who saves from sin. And that, that salvation centers on Jesus. Good. What else can we learn? I was thinking of um, the behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm. That's another name for Jesus. Yeah. And so he is the only one who can save us because he fulfills the law. Yeah. And, 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 and that would take us down, that would be like opening the door to another solar system um, because uh, the Lamb, so there's another, uh, uh, the Lamb of God, and, uh, and that, of course, takes us back to the Passover. Uh, so that's a very important in the history of God's people, that, that idea of uh, salvation from sin. If it takes us back to the Passover, it takes us back to a salvation from slavery. Uh, but now it's a slavery from the devil. It's a slavery from death. Um, and, uh, and, of course, the altar, the whole sacrificial system is summarized in that name. All of those animals that died, you know, those lambs, and, um, and uh, he is a savior from sin, Jesus. So you, and that, that's why you don't take the name Jesus in vain, right? That, that's, that's the third commandment, like, because it, it, there's so much... Um, of God's love, his covenant love for his people um, that is built into that, that name. So it, that, it's never a name that we uh, can take in vain. Uh, God will not hold him guilty. That's how important the name is. That, that name uh, that is above every other name. A name isn't just like um, the sound waves that come out of our mouth. Um, it, it's the, the history of redemption. It's, it's the story of God. Uh, and uh, that, so you, there's so much in the name of, of Jesus. And again, I, that one of the reasons I just wanted to stop and meditate on this and, and for you to think about is, again, I, I read the Bible, and you, you can read you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, Jesus, Jesus, and the name, you know, but uh, sometimes we need to just stop and say, what does that name mean? And, uh, and to just... Uh, enjoy it. That's part of knowing God. Um, and that's part of uh, also then knowing more about myself, because he's a savior from your sin. And, and you come to know that name in a new way, and a name that can be placed on you in baptism. Names are a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and, and of course, that the name of Jesus is, there are combinations of it. Like, Jesus is called like 30 times in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus. So there's um, or our Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ the Lord. So there's a lot of other uh, ways in which um, that you'll find these names and titles uh, that come together. Um, so, and Peter does something quite wonderful, and John already picked up on it 
with the deity of Jesus as God is the one who saves from sin. Um, and Peter does too, and I don't have time to look into it. And I'm not an expert in Greek grammar, so I struggle with that. But there's something that you should know, and you can look it up and study it on your own time if you'd like. It's called uh, the Granville Sharp Rule. And if you look carefully at uh, verse 1, um, grammatically um, underneath here, but you can see it in the English, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, um, Jesus Christ. And what Peter is doing here in verse 1, uh, grammatically, um, that the God and Savior, he's referring to the same person here. So it's not like he's referring to God as uh, like the Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. He, Peter is talking about the same person in verse 1. He's calling Jesus Christ God. Um, this is one of the great Christological um, texts where we find uh, the deity of Jesus mentioned. So again, it's, it's the grammar of the text, but you can see that the same grammar is used uh, also in verse um, 11. Uh, For in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the same um, person in verse 11, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the same grammatical construction, our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, as John pointed out, you can know Jesus as God from other things, like the, uh, he saves us from sin. Uh, but Peter is also calling Jesus God. So you can, um, again, that would be another uh, name or title for, for Jesus that is, is right here um, that uh, you can study more um, on, on your own time. And uh, along with that, um, just, uh, well, any comments or questions about that so far? Heidi? Can you just remind me about Lord with capital? Ah, yeah, that's our next one. Because Lord is, um, is uh, one of the, the uh, titles here. So let, yeah, well, let's get to that. Are there any other questions about Jesus, Savior, grammar? I'm not the uh, grammar gorilla, but Heidi is. I'll put you on the spot. All right, so, uh, so yes, that is another uh, title here. Um, we'll, we'll go to Lord since you asked about it. Um, but uh, so the, uh, the, the New Testament um, title, Lord, Kurios, um, is, uh, it, um, it goes back to Exodus 3. And um, in the, the Old Testament, you may remember that the, the name of God, I am who I am, um, is, is Yahweh. And, uh, and that's the Hebrew. And the, the Old Testament scriptures, uh, about 200 years before Jesus, were translated into Greek. And uh, the Greek Septuagint would translate Yahweh as Kyrios. So this would be another way of knowing who Jesus is and another reason why we are Trinitarian Christians. And I mentioned that this last Lord's Day. We're partakers of the divine nature, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, so the New Testament writers are, are also using kurios for Jesus um, in the way in which it was used in the uh, Greek Old Testament, uh, kurios for the covenant of God. So Jesus is Yahweh. That's another way to understand uh, Lord. And, and as you begin to think about knowing God through his names and titles, um, the Lord was one of the most important titles that God used in um, who I am today. Uh, I, would, I attribute my conversion um, to somebody explaining to me that Jesus is both Savior and Lord. And there was an invitation that was given to me when I was 17. Uh, I think it was kind of put in the, the language, would you like to pray and make Jesus the Lord of your life? And that's part of knowing God, right? So you know people through their names and their titles. You think about your names and titles, and they tell, your, they tell part of your story. God's much bigger than we are. He has a lot more names and titles, but um, he will give us a name, by the way, that he hasn't given to us yet. Um, but uh, I, I didn't know Jesus as Lord. So I, I would follow Jesus kind of part-time. And, um, and it was an invitation. That, and would you... 
would you, Aaron, it wasn't exactly put to me this way, but would you like to know God and Jesus as the Lord of your life? Do you know him as Savior? You understand that he died for sin and you believe that, and that's very important. But would you like to know him in a, new, a different way and not just know him as Lord on Sundays, but for everything? Would you like to know him as Lord in your thoughts all the time? Would you like to know him as Lord in, in your actions? Not all the time, I still sin, but making that the goal of your life uh, in, in your thoughts, words, and your deeds. Would, in those areas that you're not following it and you don't know him as Lord, would you, Aaron, would like to put that off and, and, and turn away from that? And that was the, one of the most momentous decisions I, I remember in my whole life when I said, uh, yes, I... Uh, it was by God's grace that I said that, because I was like, this is a whole new knowledge. This is a whole new way of following Jesus. Uh, but I'm, I'm so thankful for this title, Lord. It's changed, and it's still changing, you know, me uh, and other people. So Lord, yeah, these, so when we're talking about the names and titles, we're talking about knowing God. Um, and it, it's, yes, it is a head knowledge, right? So we, we, we have, we have, uh, the ability to think God's thoughts, have nerves. Our minds are wonderful things. Um, but it's also a knowledge of knowing in the sense that God knows us on a personal, intimate level, and we can know him as partakers of the divine nature on the most personal and intimate levels um, as well, because the lordship of Jesus uh, affects me in the most personal and intimate ways in what I do and what I don't do. Uh, he, he is my, my lord. And, and certainly as Peter's talking about these, these, these titles, he, his life changed. And, and as, as you grow in your knowledge of, of God, and this is what Peter is leaving, right? So Peter is leaving behind uh, the, the word of God. He's, he's leaving behind the, this witness and this testimony so that we might grow in our knowledge of him. But think of, of Peter's life and how the title Christ is a, a title that he grew to understand over time. When he first confessed Jesus as Christ, he didn't really know what that meant. Yeah, he knew what that meant with David and the Holy Spirit coming upon David, and he understood that, but he didn't understand the cross. And, and, uh, and so that the, na- the knowing God is a, it's, it's a life, eternal lifelong uh, journey, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a glorious thing. It's something that we, uh, we're constantly inviting other people uh, to know the Lord, to know him as your, as, uh, to know Jesus as God, to know the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an invitation to take that step and, and knowing God as your Savior, knowing that as a Savior you can really trust him, uh, knowing God as a, a Lord, that you can really follow him and believe in him. And, and Peter's been doing this now his, his whole life, and he's coming to the end of his life, and he wants us to know the Lord, uh, and to know the Lord as he knew him, as he in a way, we, we can't. We're not eyewitnesses like the apostle, um, but we can know and have the same faith, the same kind of faith um, as, as Peter and those who were eyewitnesses. So Peter is reminding us here, it's, it's just part of the journey. It, 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 it is a greeting in the first verses, um, but the, the names and titles are, are an invitation for us to say, yeah, I, I, I would like to know Jesus as my Savior. I'd like to know him as God. I haven't known him in that way. I would like to know him as the, the Christ or, or to be able to learn more about Christ um, and Lord. So it's a, it's a life-changing thing. It certainly was for Peter, for me, I hope for you uh, as well, um, because I think all of you here have been baptized. So the name of God is on you. That is life-changing uh, in, the, in the best of, in the most eternal and everlasting of, of ways. Uh, so God's name is a, and his titles are just wonderful uh, to meditate upon. And I'm just picking some of the most common, um, but just because they're common don't mean they're less important. We're just probably less, you know, we just maybe take them for granted. Any other comments or questions before we close in prayer? You guys have two minutes. 6.58. You guys are like, I'm ready to get home. It looks like it's 10.30 outside. All right, any items for prayer, praise, or thanksgiving? Jen?
So, or Megan? Yeah. At the house, okay. Yeah. So, anything else? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have um, revealed yourself to us. And uh, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us uh, in the scriptures, the very scriptures that uh, Peter um, was inspired to write by uh, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, scriptures that you, Jesus, set him apart for, things to see and to witness. And uh, we thank you uh, so very much for uh, the, uh, the, the knowledge that we, we might know you, that you've revealed yourself so that we might be in covenant and relationship with you, that it's a revelation of love. And uh, we thank you it's a revelation and a giving of yourself and that we can be partakers uh, of that with you and with one another, our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would uh, impress upon us in, in new ways um, so that we take less for granted, um, perhaps the names uh, and the titles, some, some of which are, are used in vain. Uh, and I, I pray that, that your name would be something that we, uh, we, well, we thank you that we sing about it in the Psalms and the, the excellency of your name. Uh, we thank you that uh, your name is placed upon us in, in baptism. Um, and uh, we uh, thank you that we can pray to you, Father, uh, in the name of Jesus. And um, we, uh, we pray that um, and, and thank you uh, so very much for, for these things in your glorious name and titles. We pray that uh, you <clears throat> continue to watch over and protect us. And we pray for Megan and uh, that you would protect her both body and soul. We pray also for uh, our other loved ones, as you know, Lord, the many uh, burdens and hardships that uh, we bear, and, um, and we bring those before uh, your throne of grace. Uh, as Peter taught in his previous letter, uh, we know that we can cast all of these things upon you because you care for us. And that Peter also heard the used Jesus say, um, uh, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And so we thank you that we can come to you as a savior Jesus, the savior from sin. We can come to you uh, because we know that you love us. We thank you that that love is signified um, by your death on the cross. We thank you that that love is confirmed by the Holy Spirit um, in our hearts. And uh, we thank you. Uh, as, as Peter anticipated his earthly departure, uh, his exodus, uh, we thank you so very much for uh, the hope of glory. And I pray that we would be growing in faith and hope and love. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.